Well, I almost didn't make it all the way up to the balcony, all the way back down, all the way up to the sound room, all the way back down. Praise the Lord back in there. Five verses. Made it. All right, let's take our Bibles. Turn, if you will, with me to the book of Acts. We are looking at rather exciting adventures in the life of the Apostle Paul. Tonight is the weariness. The weariness of the mission. In Acts chapter 20, we're looking at the first six verses, Acts chapter 20. Before we do, let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And how we thank you that we can stand on the promises of the Word of God. We have your Word. Oh, Father, how we praise you and thank you that you have given us the Word of God in the English language. And, Father, we treat it often with such disrespect. So often we are careless with it. We fail to study it. We fail to read it, even. We fail to obey it when we know what it says. Father, we pray that you'll forgive us for that. That you'll make us more zealous to stand on the Word of God. If your word says it, that settles it, whether we believe it or not. And Father, we pray that you will encourage our hearts tonight as we study the scriptures, as we see the, the Apostle Paul, a man who was motivated to serve Jesus Christ because he knew that what he had was true. Help us to remember that what we have is true. We don't have to be ashamed of it. We don't have to soft pedal it. We can declare it with boldness because it is accurate and it is powerful. It is quick. It's living and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. We can put on a good show on the outside, but your word reveals what's really in our hearts. And when there's sin there, Father, your Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. And either we can confess it and repent or else we can harden our hearts as Pharaoh did. Father, we pray that you will cause us, when we come under the convicting work of your Holy Spirit as the Word of God is applied to our hearts, that we would confess our sins, because you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Father, we pray that you'll take the Word of God tonight and use it in our hearts to transform our lives in the image of Jesus Christ. For we pray in his name. Amen. May you recall... Last week we were looking at a rather important portion of Scripture in the last few verses of Acts chapter 19. In fact, 20 verses altogether are given to this one incident out of the book of Acts. The message last week was entitled, Money and Pagan Gods. And we find that the Apostle Paul is in um, Ephesus, and uh, there was a silversmith by the name of Demetrius, and uh, he suddenly began to realize that his bottom line was dropping off, and he tracked it back to the Apostle Paul, because Paul was leading so many people to Christ that they were no longer buying the shrines of Diana. He made these little silver shrines for the goddess Diana. Diana was the goddess of Ephesus. I've actually walked around the streets in Ephesus where the Apostle Paul was. I've seen some of the things that you have described for you in the text here. And, uh, so Demetrius, uh, he was in some kind of silver field or union, and he got them all together and he gave them a speech about how, you know, uh, after all, everybody worships Diana and the whole world knows how great Diana is. <coughs> and, uh, oh, and he asked that way. So he starts off with a religious uh, boy, telling them about how wonderful Diana is, but the bottom line for Demetrius, and the bottom line for most people in the world, is their money. Uh, if it doesn't affect them financially, they really don't care what's going on. They can let anything else go on in the world as long as it doesn't affect the bottom line. Well, that's the thing with the United States around us. I mean, people really don't care about some of the humongous moral issues that are happening in the United States. They really don't care what's happening about, you know, the world. They really don't care what's happening about the military. They really don't care what's happening about all these other things. As long as it doesn't affect the bottom line, especially the more wealthy people, what they really care about is how is this going to affect the banks? How is this going to affect the securities that I have? Maybe the money that I have overseas, or the precious metals, or the, the jewelry and the fine arts that I've collected over the years. They really care about their money. 
And we notice that six things that just occurred when that passage started. I mean, this is a, a really intense series of events as we move through Acts chapter 18, Acts chapter 19, moving on into Acts chapter 20. Paul is going through some tremendous battles. We saw that there are six things that occurred from that had taken place. Paul had just been involved in some heavy spiritual battles. He had been doing battle with demonic forces in the preceding passage. Uh, we have the story about the seven sons of Sceva and uh, how the the demon possessed man jumped on them and overcame them. Uh, Paul has just seen a great victory with many coming to Christ. The devil has just been defeated. The demonic source resources were burned. They took and burned all of those demonic uh, books and things and found it was 50,000 pieces of silver, real silver, worth a lot of money. All of you would like to have 50,000 silver $1 bills, I'm sure. Uh, $1. Um, the Christians had repented. There were Christians involved in that witchcraft. You know, it, it is astounding to me. I was just at Dean Bergen meetings uh, this past week. And uh, at the time of the Second Great Awakening in what's called the Burned Over District, a name given by Charles Finney to a certain area of New York State, the Christians there were involved in and they didn't see that it was in conflict with their Christianity. They were involved in seances. They were involved in uh, crystal ball reading. They were involved in all of the occult items that you can imagine. And they saw no conflict with their Christianity in that area of New York State. Oops. There were Christians at Ephesus who were involved in all kinds of occult And they burned that they horoscopes. I hope none of you are involved in palm reading or tarot cards or I hope you've never gone into a folks that stuff is demonic. Controlled by Ephesus, little need for conversation. He was a long way from home. He 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 wanted to travel through Macedonia, but he planned to go back to home base. He wanted to go back to Jerusalem. Back in chapter 19, verse 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in his spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying. After I've been there, I must also see Rome. He was still planning his next missionary journey. And we talked about that missionary journey, and we asked ourselves the question, what does God want me to do next? We need to be proactive in our service to God. God doesn't always give us the details of our plan, but he may give us a big picture. Paul has a big picture. Uh, he just didn't know exactly how God was going to work that out. But he was always looking for what does God want me to do next. Now, I have a question for you. I ought to ask for a show of hands, but I won't. I'm embarrassing for you. <coughs> how many of you sent that message last week? And that was a major point of the message last week. God, asking what God wants me to do next. And really being attuned to what God wants you to do. How many of you, any time during this past week, ask God, Lord, what do you really want me to do next? I mean, I'm not talking about, shall I wash the fork first or the knife first? Uh, you know, shall I wash the plates before I wash the glasses? And by the way, you should always wash your glasses first because that way you don't have any uh, grease in the water when you're washing your glasses. Uh, what do you want me to do next? Maybe I finished some big project. What do you want me to do next? You know, I've been having to ask myself that question. I've just finished a major thing. project. Doing that paper that I've been working on. So my focus, my goal is now more to start with the next one. There are several things the Lord has put in my mind that need to be taken care of right away because they are establishing foundations for other things. Did you even once this past week ask yourself, what does God want me to do next? You may know his big plan. Yes, my big plan is to witness to somebody somewhere, someplace, sometime, uh, and uh, live a good life, uh, you know, and eat a healthy diet. You know, I'm talking about. What? Is God giving you a focus? He should. He will. If you're ready to serve him, 
What is the focus that God puts in your heart that you need to do next so that you can most effectively serve Jesus Christ to the maximum? So you can maximize your potential. So that you will not waste time. Remember we talked about wasting time is wasting your life? What is the next thing God has put in your heart that you must do to bring glory to Jesus Christ? Not what's the next thing I want to do to make myself feel satisfied. Not what's the next thing that I ought to do so that I can make a little more money. What is the next thing that I should do so that Jesus Christ might receive the greatest amount, the maximum glory? That was one of the big questions we asked last week. Be ready to let God alter your course and your direction because that's what God did with Paul. God said, yes, Paul, you got the big plan. You're going to go to Jerusalem and you're going to go to Rome. But P.S., it's not going to be the way you think you're going to get to Rome. In fact, God saw to it that the Roman government paid for Paul's travel expenses. <laughs> and when Paul got to Rome, uh, God had a house rented for him by the government where he was able to stay for two years and people were able to come from all over. Paul had wanted to plant a mission in Rome because, after all, that was the center of the ancient world. And so God said, you know, Paul, that's a great idea. You got that idea for me. Uh, but, you know, since you've been such a good, faithful steward, I'm going to make sure that not only do you get safely to Rome, but you're going to have an armed bodyguard of Roman soldiers that get you all the way to Rome so that you don't have to keep worrying about assassination. Our text tonight has, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul is having to avoid some assassinations again in our text tonight uh, as we, we get on into that passage a little bit. And then we saw that uh, the second thing we learned from the passage in Acts 19 was that Paul had men who were willing to actively work with him to accomplish the goals that God set before him. You know how hard it is to fly solo? I mean, I've had to do that time where there was nobody that wanted to be helpful. They all wanted to go along for the ride. They all wanted to go along for the ride as long as I did all the work. Paul had men who put them to accomplish the goals that God had set before him. Paul kept those who were working with him busy with profitable work. He didn't just keep them around for his own personal benefit. He took some of his most important men and sent them out into the field. Verse 22. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. And that's when we have the, the riot in the place of the Ephesians and the craftsmen. Then we saw the bottom line last week was greed, the love of money is the root of all evil. And the Apostle Paul says that as he writes to Timothy. One of the young men that he sends away from Ephesus, he later writes to Timothy, and he says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain that we can carry nothing out, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Most of us are not content with food and clothing. We also want a car. We also want housing. Uh, we also want air conditioning. <laughs> Ooh, how we want air conditioning, right? <laughs> Especially on days like today. We want all kinds of peripherals. And it's not we just want food. We want good food. It's not we just want clothing. We want nice clothing. You know? Paul says, if you learn contentment, you'll be content with food and clothing, whatever it is that God provides. But they that will be rich, those who have their focus on money, fall into temptation and a snare. You know, that's one of the snares of the devil. Satan watches us all the time to see what is it that tempts us. Some people are tempted by power. I mean, they, they, can, they just salivate whenever they think of being in control of other people. Some people are tempted by physical desires, immorality, and in our day and age, it's of all different stripes. But most people are tempted by money. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. You know, years ago, there was a very wealthy man, and his name doesn't come to my mind right away. Uh, he ended up dying. He ended up being actually involved in the Mormon religion. And uh, so he had people around him all the time taking care of all of his needs. He was a multi-billionaire. And um, as an old man, he would be eating vanilla ice cream. 
all those billions of dollars, you know, and somebody once asked him, so-and-so, well, I mean, you've got all this money, you know, what, how much more do you want? And his response was, well, just a little more. Just a little more. Folks, how, how short-sighted that is when life is so very, very fleeting. And it can be over in a heartbeat. It can be over in the next breath that you take. And so the Apostle Paul goes on for the love of money, verse 10, is the root of all evil. Not money, but the love of money. That's three. Which, while some coveted after now here, is the big They have erred from the faith. You see, money is a God. And when you worship a false God, you err. It will turn you aside from true theology when you have greed and covetousness in your heart. And pierce themselves through with themselves. It doesn't mean the joy that you think it's going to be. It's like an arrow or a sword or a spear. It pierces you with many sorrows. They hold on eternal life, one through thou art also called, and that's the best of good perfection before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who took in the fall of things before Christ, Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate, that's the good confession, without keep this commandment, without his heart, and the people will be appearing of the Holy Spirit. Now this is his idolatry, for so simple option, 3 5 and 3 5 5, and he tells us that the covetous man is an idolatry. Covetousness, idolatry, covetous man, and idolatry. The Christians at Corinth, excuse me, at Ephesus, practicing idolatry just as badly as the weakest of silversmiths, because Paul had to write that to them in Ephesians 5 5. Remember, that's where the weakest is, that's where the riot is, that's where the riot is, that's where the riot is, talk about Jesus, therefore I cannot talk about Jesus, but who's having God? Your Muslim boss or God himself who gave you the command. I mean, who's higher? If you have two authorities in conflict, the principle is all you always obey the highest authority. What did God, the Lord Jesus himself, tell you? Ye are my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, what part of your boss's building is not in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, or the uttermost part of the earth. <laughs> is there some place that's been carved out on the face of planet earth that God says, this area you don't have to witness in? I know, I'm putting the burr under people's saddle. But you know, that's what the scripture says, isn't it? Is Jesus Lord only part of the day? Or are there eight hours during the day where Jesus is not Lord, somebody else is Lord? Uh, but outside of those eight hours, hey, 40 hours a week, you know, don't belong to God. 
168 hours. After all, we're giving him a, you know, a, a 128 hours, so he should be satisfied with that, right? Well, let's see. Out of that, you do sleep quite a bit, I suspect. You know, so we can subtract that. And part of the time you're eating and there's nobody else around, so I guess we can subtract that. Well, which part belongs to God? I think it's a rather important question for us to ask. And then we said, well, there, you might respond, I live like a Christian every day at work. Okay, that's like the mushy, smelly answer that you believe in God, and so does the devil, and he trembles. Who cares if you think you are living like a Christian at work? It's better than living like a degenerate drunk at work, coming in stone, stoned on drugs every day at work. I mean, that's obviously better than that. But even Jesus, who lived a perfect life, had to witness. He opened his mouth to tell people why he was doing it, and he's called on us to do it also. Paul explained what the gospel could do. That's why he witnessed. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He knew what the gospel could do. That's the first reason he witnessed. Second, Paul was motivated by hope and love, love for the lost, and hope that some would believe. If you never witness, that's convincing proof that you have no love for the lost, and it's a convincing proof that you have no real hope that any of them will be, uh, be saved. Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now that brings us to our text for tonight, the first six verses of Acts chapter 20. And after the uproar was ceased, that is that riot that we've been talking about with Demetrius and the silversmiths, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece. And there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria, he proposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied him into Asia, Sophiter of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. These going before tarried for us at Troas, and we sailed away from Philippi after, days of, of the, after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. Now, before we actually get into that, I didn't quite finish off the material that I'd wanted to cover last week, so I want to go quickly through that and then we'll jump into our text because this is essential background uh, for what's happening in the first six verses of Acts chapter 20. Usually our real motivation for not witnessing is a dual motivation. On the positive side, if you can call that positive, it's covetousness. We're so worried that we're going to lose money if we witness. But the other part of that motivation on the negative side of you is we don't want to suffer. We know that if we witness, we may have to suffer. We don't want to lose any money, of course, but we don't want to suffer for any other reason also. Listen to what Peter says about suffering because you're real Christian testimony. 1 Peter 4.12 This is written to Christians. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, you know, we begin to suffer a little bit. We say, oh, that's weird. I'm not supposed to suffer. I thought everybody who loved Jesus, why, why we're not going to have any problems now? Well, that's what the charismatics will tell you. That's what the prosperity gospel will tell you. That's not what the Bible tells you. Peter says, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial. This isn't just a little bit uncomfortable, like the air conditioning goes out. You think, man, I'm sweating. Mm. Yeah, drop yourself into the fire and then you'll wish that you were in the warm room instead of in the fire. As though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. How badly did Christ suffer? Was it a mild, like he got a bug bite? Uh, he brushed up against a, a sharp thorn bush and scratched himself? How badly did Christ suffer? It says you're going to be partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. So there's not only fiery trials here, there's not only participation in Christ's suffering, but there's also reproach. Oh, how we hate to be reproached. That means people are saying bad things about us because we're Christians. We want everybody to honor us, don't we? 
We don't want them to say bad things about us. We walk into a room and we see people whispering and looking and pointing our direction and uh, we begin to walk over toward them and then they put a big grin on their face and this plastic hit their face goes up and they greet us and they tell us how nice we are and all that kind of stuff, but you know they've been talking about you. You're walking into the room. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Look forward to it. Don't say, oh my, I've got to change so that nobody will know I'm a Christian. No, he says, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. That's one of the ways that the spirit of God and the glory of God are resting on you. Is you are reproached. Mm, but it goes on, for the name of Christ. We can be reproached for all kinds of other things, and we probably deserve it. But if you're reproached for the name of Christ, he says, the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, that is the guys who are talking about you, he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Helps you stand out from who the real Christians are and who the real Christians aren't. And then Peter says, now there are some things you ought not to be reproached for. Verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yeah, yeah, Christians ought to be, not be murderers. I mean, you know, uh, we should, you, know, you get reproached if you don't go to jail, too. You get reproached if you, you're a murderer, or if you're a thief, or an evildoer. What about that last word? Or as a busybody in other men's matters. You know, I, I know there are no Christians like this. I'm sure I've never been in this. Um, to a busybody. So we can pray more intelligently. the little sins that we excuse, the little little sins that we shove under the rug are not as little as we think they are. Busybody in other men's matters. Verse 16. Now here's why you're supposed to suffer. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. The world wants to shame you. The world wants to make you feel ashamed because you have talked about Jesus. The world wants to make you feel ashamed because you have done what is pure and right and holy and godly. They're not ashamed of all over the world. They're not ashamed because you're a Christian. If any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God and risk their hand. So, how do you keep from being ashamed of the gospel of God? So, what does the Bible do in terms of some kind of mechanism, if you will, so that we will not be ashamed to witness? How many of you have been Christians are supposed to witness. I mean, that's the whole point. So, how do you keep being ashamed of the gospel of Christ? There are three rules. Three rules for not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Rule number one keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Rule number one is keep your eyes focused on Jesus. That's all for the they looked unto him and were like him, and their faces were not ashamed. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Look unto him. And the mother be Rule number two. Keep your heart obedient to the Bible. Not just your extra life. Keep your heart obedient to the Bible. Let my heart be sound in thy soul. That I be not ashamed. You 
water not be ashamed, keep your heart in God's statutes, that will keep you from not ever being ashamed. Rule number three. Always tell the truth. See, man, that's going to be hard for me because I tend to bend stuff. You know, I mean, just to make it a little round at the corner so it, it more smooth as I tell it. <laughs> Always tell the truth. 2 Corinthians 7.14 For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. But as we speak all things to you in truth, even so our boasting which I made before Titus is found a truth. You see, if you get out there and if you're telling mostly truth, but you're also just sort of padding it to make it sound good, the people you're witnessing to, they will find out which parts were not true, and then they will question the whole thing. Then they will question the whole thing. They say, you know, he told me that, that Jesus really transforms lives, but, you know, and I was really excited about the things he told me about the gospel, but then I found out that he lied to me on this, or he didn't tell me the truth on that. And what's that going to do? That's going to make them question the gospel that you shared with them. Three rules so that you'll never be ashamed to witness. Number one, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Number two, keep your heart obedient to the Bible. Number three, always tell the truth. But, of course, you know, the world will try to make you feel ashamed of the false shame as a means of controlling you. You know, shame is a way in which you can control people, and the world knows that. There is true shame when you sin, and the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin. Romans 6.21, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed, for the end of those things is death. There is a genuine shame because it is as a result of sin which leads to death. But there's also a false shame when you're ashamed for sticking out like a sore thumb because you, as a Christian, really are different. I hope you understand that. As a Christian, you really are different. And you do things that show that you're different. You know the truth and you do the truth. There are two passages that illustrate this principle. 2 Timothy 1.12 For the which cause I also suffer these things. Remember Peter's been talking about suffering. Just so you remember where we are, we're in Acts, we're looking at the reasons Paul witnessed and most of us don't. He understood the power of the gospel and he was not ashamed of the gospel because it was the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. That's why we're talking about shame. The devil wants you to be ashamed so that you will not witness. Why was Paul willing to suffer all those beatings? Why was Paul willing to go through all that stuff that he went through and all the assassination attempts on his life? Why did he keep moving forward? He had his eyes focused on Jesus. He didn't have his eyes focused on money. He didn't have his eyes focused on power. He didn't have his eyes focused on fame. He didn't have his eyes focused on sex. He didn't have his eyes focused on all those other things that are out there. He had his eyes focused on Jesus, and he was not ashamed. 2 Timothy 1.12 For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. 2 Timothy 1.16 The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Onesiphorus came into the dungeons where Paul was to bring him food to bring him water, to bring him clothing, to bring him medicine, to bring him whatever he needed. And he didn't say, man, I don't want to identify with that guy. You know, that, that makes me sort of look bad with all my friends that I'm coming down to the prison here. But you know, um, someday God's going to be ashamed of some of his children. He won't be ashamed of the rest, but he'll be ashamed of some of us. Maybe somebody even sitting in this room. Maybe somebody watching this broadcast. He's going to be ashamed of you. God is going to be ashamed of you. Jesus is going to be ashamed of you. You say, where do you find that? All right. Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Are you ashamed to witness? If you're ashamed of Jesus, Jesus will be ashamed of you.
Do you want to be there? When Jesus is ashamed of you because you were motivated by money, that was your positive motive. You were motivated by fear of suffering, that was your negative motive. And so you never opened your mouth for Jesus. Another verse, Luke 9, 26, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words. Do you get it? Both passages said ashamed of me and of my words. What is he talking about? Well, you sort of live a nice Christian life. Yeah, right. We talked about that, right? Jesus himself had to testify. And what did he point back always to? The word of God. It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. You can have all your other phony holy books and all your psychology and all those other things that you're so excited about. But it is written. The word of God. Are you ashamed of the word of God? Do you have scripture memorized so that when people ask you a question, when they give a challenge to the gospel of Christ, that you have a verse of scripture that you can quote to them? You know it so well. It is a sword in your hand. You can take them to the answer from the word of God. It is the word of God that is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It's the word of God that pierces the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It's the word of God that pierces the dividing of the joints and the marrow. It's the word of God that is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is the only thing that will reach their consciences and reach their spirit and reach to the depths of their depraved souls. It's the word of God. Are you ashamed of it? If you're ashamed of it and of my words of him, shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. And when he's coming back, are you going to start sweating bullets because you know he's going to be ashamed of you? Oh, I pray God that he will not be ashamed of me. And it's a motive for being willing always ready to answer any man that asks me a reason for the hope that is in me with meekness and fear. But of others he'll not be ashamed. That's the first group. He's going to be ashamed of them. Here are the ones that he's not ashamed of. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, and Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16. Hebrews 2, 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. <laughs> you know, some guys have a brother that they're really ashamed of. You know, the first brother did really well. I mean, he made a successful life. I mean, he has a, a stable family. You know, he did well in business. Uh, he's active in his church. I mean, everything is going... And then, yeah, he had a brother, maybe a younger brother, maybe an older brother, uh, has a brother who was involved in all kinds of criminal activity, drug dealing, uh, you know, out there involved with immoral activities, out there doing all kinds of bad things and, you know, covered with tattoos and, you know, got a, a ring nose and, you know, got his hair up and, you know, one of those spiky things that goes along. You've seen those people, right, with the spiky things that go along their heads that are painted orange and green and all those other funny colors, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it's a big, nice party going on at the first brother's house and, uh, all of his friends are there, and uh, his brother comes roaring in, you know, with uh, in, in some kind of biker shorts or something, and, uh, you know, with these big dragons emblazoned all over his chest or whatever, you know, and he's drunk as a skunk, and he comes walking into the party. Is the first brother going to be ashamed of his brother? <laughs> I think he would be. Jesus will not be ashamed to call some of us brethren. He'll say, this is one of my brethren. Jesus, God incarnate, calling you a brother or a sister. Doesn't that sound exciting? That he's not ashamed to call us brethren? Hebrews eleven sixteen. Now, but now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly Where's your focus? Is your focus on earth? Or is your focus on heaven? 
that is in heavenly. Wherefore, because our desire is the better country, our desire is heaven, our desire is where Jesus is, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Oh, folks. The real question is to ask, what would Jesus do or what would Jesus expect me to do in this particular situation? After all, you're going to give an account to him someday. Not to me, not to somebody else. You're going to give an account to him someday for how you handled yourself in every situation. Of course, wisdom and courtesy and kindness are always required. But we have not been called to be obnoxious for Jesus. That's not what he's talking about. We have been called upon to always communicate the truth in love in every setting of life. That's what witnessing is all about. Paul did it at Ephesus, but because it affected sales, that was that group that got upset. You know, just look at it this way. If people get upset because of your witnessing, just relax. Let it happen. <laughs> Just let them get mad. Just smile. You don't have to be nasty about it. Just share the truth. Leave the results to God. Too many people use, um, you know, at Evangelistic Crusades, use the sad stories and all this kind of stuff and the soft music playing in the background and the altar call where, where you have people ready to prime the pump. And so when the altar call is given, and some of the mass crusades, you know this is true, um, I've probably been to some of them. I've been to many different revivals and evangelists, and especially during the years that I was growing up, they were being held all over the country by multiple different people. And uh, when the altar call is given, there are certain people who are already Christians who have been primed in advance to stand up and move slowly toward the front so that there are people walking down the aisle so that if a sinner is coming under conviction of sin, they won't feel embarrassed like they're the only one. You prime the pump. And they think that these are people coming forward to receive Christ. I hate using deception in the proclamation of the gospel. Because when people find it out, they're going to say, you know, I wonder if it's really genuine. Just what we were talking about just a minute ago. Anyway. So, as we saw a great deal of things, if you identify with somebody who's willing to be on the firing line, you'll probably get shot at yourself. Uh, remember, um, Tychicus was not uh, ashamed to, Atrophimus was not ashamed to, to go into the prison where uh, Paul was. Uh, here we find that there were some men who were identified with the Apostle Paul. Um, Gaius and Aristarchus were caught and dragged into the theater, you recall. Uh, it might take you by surprise if you identify with somebody who was on the firing line. Paul was on the firing line. They knew these were his traveling paintings. They dragged him into the theater. Hey, maybe someday. Hey, wouldn't this be exciting? Maybe someday people will be after me. Do you think it could happen? Do you think it could happen? Yeah, yeah. I think it could happen. What if they couldn't find me, but they know you come to this church or you're identified with me? What would you do if they grabbed you? That's what they did with these two guys, Gaius and Aristarchus. <laughs> the whole city was filled with confusion having caught Gaius and Aristarchus men of Macedonia Paul's traveling companions they rushed with one accord into the theater <laughs> oh my there's a lot in here some cried one thing some another they didn't know why they were there and um, with that in mind let's talk about the weariness of missions here's a good place to rem remember 2 Corinthians chapter 11 we have our passage dealing with missions but we're going to pop over to 2 Corinthians 11 in just a moment because the Apostle Paul there explains theologically what was going on in his experience and in his mind on this set of missionary journeys as he's moving through Macedonia and Achaia, going back to Jerusalem. Now, in that context, let's think about those six verses in Acts. Look at the different stresses that the Apostle Paul faced here. After the uproar was ceased, Paul called on him, the disciples embraced them, departed for to go into Macedonia. 
When he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece. He abode there three months. When the Jews laid wait for him, there they are again, ready to assassinate him. As he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. There accompanied unto him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus, and Trophimus. These going before tarried at Troas, we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. The first stress that I see here in the text is the stress of many farewells with people that Paul loved. Many farewells. Some of them he would never see again. On this trip, and we're going to see it at the end of the chapter, he's going to stop at Ephesus and say goodbye to the elders at Ephesus. He has a farewell speech for them, and he tells them, you know, I'm never going to see you again never going to see you again. Some of you have had to say last goodbyes to people you really loved. Now you know what's in my heart, the last goodbyes that I had to say. But you've been through it too, every one of you. And Paul tells them, after my departing, another grievous wolf shall enter into the flock, not sparing anybody. He gives the elders some, some very strict warnings about watching for the wolves that are going to come in. Because he says, I know it's going to happen. That's the way Satan works. It's a stress. This afternoon I had to say goodbye to Megley for just a week. But you know that puts a stress on me as a dad because I love her. I don't want to get back to her. She's a special treasure. She's my youngest. And so it's always with real... You know, I don't want to say fear, but with, oh Lord, watch over her she drives. Keep her safe. Keep the car running well. You know, protect her from people who might try to harm her. Make her invisible to people who might any any way harm her in any way. Beautiful young woman driving alone through the evening. Stopping for gas, stopping here or there, taking a wrong turn. Saying farewells, even temporary farewells are hard. Paul had some stress on him here. The stress of many farewells with people that he loved. Second thing we find is the stress of walking hundreds of miles. Now, we don't pick that up because we're so used to, oh yeah, I can get from here to there because I'm taking a plane. You know, or, yeah, the bus will stop, and man, i got to wait 15 minutes for that bus. Ooh, ugh. You know, and we gripe about it. And then we get on the bus, and we go all the way to New York City in two hours. Paul didn't have buses. He didn't have planes. He didn't have trains. Paul walked. You look at a map of, of the Mediterranean area and you look at all the places Paul walked. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. Get the map out of the back of your Bible, uh, you know, because they got maps of all of Paul's missionary journeys and almost all the Bibles. They got all these missionary maps there. Just realize that most of the time he was walking. Now he did get to sail some, but they weren't exactly cruise liners that Paul was sailing on. <laughs> Those were stinky, filthy, rotten, smelly ship full of all, ships full of all kinds of uh, produce and all kinds of animals and all kinds of people who hadn't had a shower. They didn't have showers, folks. Or a bath for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And then you had the storms. And then you had lousy food. Think about that when you read, because Paul is talking about all the places he's traveling right now. And he goes here for five days, and then he stays for seven days, and it takes him so long to get to that point. And, uh, he was here for three months. Well, at least that was a three-month break. Most of us would not like to have this kind of a lifestyle, would we? It's part of the agony of certainly being an early missionary and the agony of modern missionaries today who have to live in rather primitive areas. The stress of walking hundreds of miles. You know, one of the stresses that most folks don't understand is the third stress that I see in the text. It's in verse 2. And had given them much exhortation, the stress of preaching. 
You have no idea how much it takes out of me to preach on a Sunday. Far more than doing physical exercise. After Sunday morning services, I am totally exhausted. all the time it says and had given them much exhortation he came into Greece oh there we have some more walking going on drive the stress of short periods of time how can I maximize my time I'm going to be here for a few days what can I do to maximize it? the stress of making sure that every moment counts for eternity The constant threat of death and assassination. And when the Jews they wait for him, as he was about to say in the story, you think that once he got out of their territory, they would give up. Don't you remember when he was going to be a How they despised him when he the city and raised up his army and his destiny. Some of these people left it. Some of them got sick. Always got it. Most of them were in the past, disabled Corinth. But Trophimus, have I left it? The Apostle Paul had to get the key. But you know the key. So that the gospel, as it was proclaimed, would be authenticated by the time of seven signs of the five years.
They had seen before with him in the city Trophimus and Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. There was something about Trophimus where they recognized that he was a Greek. Now, there were Greeks running in and out of the city of Jerusalem all the time, but they couldn't go into the temple. You know, there was restrictions. I mean, that's like for the holy Jews. And I mean, uh, there was a courtyard of the Gentiles. The Gentiles could get that far. And then um, there, were, there was a courtyard where the women could go, and it had four different corners, and there were different things in each corner, for healing of leprosy and for the purification of the women, and all kinds of things like that. And then there was this little wall, and only Jewish men could go there. So they've been following Paul. They know who Paul is. They know who his companions are. And they've seen Trophimus with Paul in the city. Be careful who you identify with. <laughs> you might make some enemies. Happened to Trophimus here, and the Apostle Paul, they figured, man, he must have violated the law. He must have dragged one of those Gentiles, his converts. And he didn't preach the law anymore. So I bet he pulled him with him to just sort of stand behind me and look down and we'll, we'll sort of sidle into the, the men's area of the temple and you get a good view. Be sure you got your camera hidden. Don't let them see your cameras. You take pictures like, you know. <laughs> yeah, that was Trophimus. He came from Ephesus. Some of these people were truly faithful, not just people who left him or who suffered later. They were truly faithful like Erastus and Trophimus and others who paid for it with their health. You know, Proverbs 25, verse 19 tells us, Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble. Do you think Paul was going through some times of trouble? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you look at his missionary journeys here. He's going through times of trouble. Proverbs says, Confidence in an unfaithful man. Paul wanted faithful men with him. Every pastor wants faithful man. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble. He says, like two things. It's like a broken tooth or a foot out of joint. You say, whoa, what's that supposed to mean? Okay, suppose you have a broken tooth. Now, I broke a tooth once. I was eating popcorn that Judy had fixed, and I loved her popcorn. She made some really nice popcorn. Uh, and I, I bit down on it, and there was one kernel that hadn't popped. And it sheared the side of one of my teeth off. Tell me, did I just sort of say, oh, too bad, you know, I guess I'm going to have to go to the dentist. Was there any pain involved in that? Do you, how many of you have ever had pain from one of your teeth for some reason? Anybody? Yeah, we see a few hands. We see a few hands out there. Yeah. Okay. If you, if, there's, if you place confidence, if you trust a man who is not faithful, it's like biting down on a tooth that is broken and it gives you excruciating pain because you relied on them and it didn't come through. Or a foot out of joint. Have you ever sprained an ankle? You know, that, that lasts a while, doesn't it? Does it hurt? Does it throb? Do you have a hard time walking? You can hardly do anything with all the rest of your body because you're hobbling along. I was in Israel, and I fell down the side of Mount Zion, and I sprained my ankle. And I mean, talk about difficulty, because in Jerusalem you have to walk every place. And I had that thing bound up with an ace bandage. I mean, it was like for more than a month. You know, every now and then I still get a twinge out of that foot, out of that ankle. I can still tell that years ago, years ago, more than 40 years ago, I sprained that ankle. So when you put weight down on it, confidence in an unfaithful man. It's like a broken tooth. Confidence in a faithful man is like a foot out of joint. You put weight down on it. You trust it to carry you so that you can take your next step. And what does it give you? It gives you excruciating pain. Shoots through your body. 
That's why it's so important for man to be faithful. Reliable, trustworthy. Because when you depend on them and your life, in Paul's case, might have depended on these men. His life might have depended on them. Suppose they were unfaithful men. Are you faithful? Are you faithful? Listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now Paul's talking about himself and he's using himself as an illustration here. Paul is a faithful man. But look what he says in verse 2. He said, let a man so account of us. When you're taking them up count by count, you know, man by man, minister by minister, we're stewards of the mysteries of Christ, uh, of God. Moreover, it is required, not suggested, not hoped for, it is required in stewards that a man be found, what's our key word? Faithful. It is required that a man be found faithful. You see, we see some incredible illustrations with the team that Paul had assembled together here of that kind of a man. The missionary journey was difficult. The missionary journey was exhausting. It was a weariness in missions. Ephesians 6.21 Let me tell you about one of those men, Tychicus, but that you may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things. Paul could give him an assignment and he did it. He didn't putter around. He didn't say maybe next week. He did it. Ephesians 6.24 Remember, Paul has just been at Ephesus, right? Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. To the Ephesians written from Rome by Tychicus. Paul was the amanuensis, the scribe who took Paul's notes when he was in Rome sending it back to the church at Ephesus. That was a man who hung in there with the Apostle Paul. Colossians 4, 7, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Colossians 4, 18, The salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds. This was not just when he was in his own hired house. Grace be with you. Amen. Written from Rome to Colossians by Tychicus and Onesimus. 2 Timothy 4.12 Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. Titus 3.12 When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Providing for all of his traveling companions. And finally, an eighth one, our time is out. We never did get back to that Second Corinthians passage which describes in detail some of the things that Paul suffered on his missionary journeys. But travel in unsafe weather conditions. <laughs> Any of you have ever traveled in unsafe weather conditions? I can remember a number of years ago as I was driving, driving with Judy and most of our kids, we were driving through Washington, D.C. and a hurricane was coming in. And normally driving around the Beltway in Washington, of course, um, you know, it's jammed with traffic. We got on the beltway and we didn't really realize how bad this hurricane was supposed to be. It is the only time in my life that I've seen the beltway totally empty. I mean, the wind was blowing really hard. The rain was coming like directly at the the car. I mean, you know, it wasn't falling down like this even at an angle. It was you know, blowing straight into us. Unsafe travel conditions. We're going to see that as we get a little farther onto the passage here. Did Paul have some stress? Do you think he ever got weary in his missions work? Now the question, did he ever give up? No. You and I have never faced any of the kind of opposition that Paul faced. You see, because Paul's motivations were not fear. Paul's motivations were not money. Paul's motivations were keeping his eyes on Jesus. Paul had the motivation of always telling the truth. Paul had the Word of God in his heart. His heart was controlled by Scripture. And that can't be unless you hide God's Word in your heart. Are you doing it? You memorize? 
Do you meditate on Scripture? Is it your chief delight and joy of your life? The Word of God. You'll never be the kind of witness that God called you to be unless it is. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your Word and for its power. We thank you that you have called us to be your witnesses. You've not only commissioned us, but you've given us all the necessary spiritual equipment to do it. And most of us leave home without it. And we don't take it with us to work. We don't take it with us when we go shopping. We don't take it with us when, whenever we're someplace where we're going to run into people. We don't have it. And we don't have it memorized. And when opportunity arises, we think maybe there'll be a better time. But we don't know if Jesus will come back tonight. We don't know if we'll drop dead tonight. Will he be ashamed of us? If we're ashamed of him, he says he will be ashamed of us when he comes in the glory of his Father with all of his holy angels. If we're ashamed of Jesus, he'll be ashamed of us. But for some, he will not be ashamed to call them brethren. Father, thank you again for your word and for its power. We pray that you'll take it and use it in the way that most perfectly glorifies Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn, if I can find my hymnal.